So today we are discussing queer and gender identities in the gender or queer woman. Of these two topics coincide and how they affect our existence. So my name is Audrey, I'm a sculpture major and a craft and materials and artistry learner. Uh, I identify as Chinese American and let's just say queer in many different ways. And I'm Liana. I'm a crafts and materials major. Um, I identify as Chinese, Japanese, and Taiwanese American, and I'm a lesbian. So all of those identifiers will give you a perception of who we are, even if your perception is wrong, because that's what labels do. First, we're just going to briefly discuss um, queer art and queer art history. Queer has always had a place in art, even if it was a struggle, and oftentimes queer artists had to make their own spaces for themselves. Just as oftentimes diaspora communities must create safe spaces for themselves, that's what queer artists have always had to do. There are some queer artists that more directly work with the queer, such as uh, Zanelle Foley. She is a South African artist who has often um, her work depicting queer bodies and carving out a space for the LGBTQ plus community in South Africa. But there are also other queer artists who don't uh, work with their queerness directly in their work, such as artists like Diane Artist, Castles, Frida Kahlo, and PJ Wiley. A lot of these artists you may not even realize are queer, however, they, their queerness somehow innately affects their work because it is a part of their being. Next we're going to discuss what it means to be an Asian in art and Asianness In traditional art and contemporary, oftentimes in the past, Asianness and art often meant like historical Asian art and what is considered aesthetically Asian. Um, art with much em emphasis on East Asian art, so like Korea, Japan, and China. However, nowadays Asianness and art can be more open and nuanced. Nowadays, it can mean that an artist of any Asian descent, whether it is Eastern Asia or Western or South or Southeast Asia, um, and everything in between who creates art. So, um, so often that art may not even be about being Asian. Asianness and art can be um, much more broad and they can just be realized. Asians in art can be known for and realized as more than their heritage and their race. So traditionally, um, Maybe more some examples of more traditional and aesthetically Asian artists uh, can include um, the Japanese block printer Hokusai and uh, traditional Chinese scroll paintings and Indian Congo paintings. Some examples here. The diaspora and being Asian also plays into just like Asian art in general, which is why when we think of traditional Asian art, it's stuff that was created in those countries, but now Asian art can be anywhere. Um, so I'm gonna first talk about like specifically Asian diaspora with my great grandparents, because uh, they were displaced in the Japanese American internment camps for three years during World War II, and they went from living in the Bay Area of California to the deserts in Topaz, Utah. It was a really traumatic event, and it changed the course of many things in a lot of people's lives. And for my great-grandparents, it changed how they made art and where they made art. They helped found an art school in Topaz uh, for those who were interned like them, and they taught classes there. My grandmother like, took classes there, and so did her brother. And their own art also changed when they were living there because they were generally painting about their surroundings and they were surrounded by deserts and barracks and barbed wire. And so that's kind of what they would make art about. After the camps, they moved to New York and like many other 
Japanese Americans, they lost that community they had built there in those three years, and they had to start all over again. They had to once again find a community, and they experienced diaspora again. Another Asian artist that grapples with diaspora within their work is Brittany Spain. She was a Chinese American Muslim painter who grew up in San Francisco, however, she was abandoned at a young age um, by her parents, and thus she bounced around um, between foster homes, specifically white foster homes, and her grandparents. However, she later in life got the opportunity to go to Cal Arts and was in introduced to abstract expressionism by her peers and her teachers, as well as traditional uh, calligraphy and Buddhism. Much of her paintings are oftentimes attempts at finding or reaching out and learning about a culture that she wasn't surrounded by or she wasn't able to be surrounded by, and yet somehow these ideas and images are still uh, like nostalgic and still perhaps what she may have considered some type of home to her. So as a young Asian American queer who most definitely did not have a space already made for her in modern art during the mid to late 1900s in America, she was often on the path to create her own space and she often used um, the things that she was constantly learning about Asian history and Asian art in her own work and finding a path for herself via her Asian -ness. Oftentimes it's hard to feel like you can fit in with the Asian community, especially with either whether it's the Asian community in Asia or an Asian diasporic community when you are queer because it is a separate level of diaspora that may or may not alienate you from your peers and your community. Yeah, and it's hard because the Asian part of our identity is something that has a literal location, but with queerness it's everywhere. There's no one set place that it started because it has been found everywhere. Another artist I want to talk about is Gay Chan, specifically her artwork Aquafenia. It's a multitude of atlases combined into nonsensical maps. There's no direction, there's no north, south, east, west, there's literally nowhere to go. And when one or one's ancestors have moved into another country they're not from, it's really difficult to find the literal space that you feel like you can fit in, especially when there's another part of one's identity that hasn't had a place to fit in for a long time. And in Chan's work, she connects the disconnected through the parts of the maps representing all of her identities into these maps. So now we're going to talk about what it specifically means to be a queer Asian and what that identity means as a whole. Because in many Asian cultures, being anything that other, in many Asian cultures, being anything other than a heterosexual, monogamous, cisgender person would be seen as taboo. And it's difficult to have to juggle these two identities because they often conflict amongst. <laughs> it's difficult to have. Oh my god. <coughs> It's different. Yeah, and I think that we both have family members that don't know or don't realize that we're queer because it's just better to not say anything than it is to start that conversation with the part. Yeah, definitely. And Tina Takamoto is a Japanese video and performance artist who makes art about her queer identity and also her race combining together. And her most well-known piece is Looking for Jiro Onuma. It's a short film about a queer Japanese man who was incarcerated in the Japanese American internment camps, specifically Topaz. And in this work, Takamoto explores the struggle of a gay Asian bachelor in World War II through her own drag performance, expressing both the queer experience in the past and also the present. So 
So the expression of queerness can be outright in art. It can always somehow have to do with the body, whether it's about yourself or how you interact with others. And with those in mind, it's represented in either a more literal or metaphorical way. Yeah, I think this is really important, especially in the art world, um, having perhaps a visual represent representation of how being queer can interact with one's own work and how other nuances of being queer or perhaps also being Asian can affect others. For female presenting Asians, we're in a strange space because we're all we're hypersexualized and we're also hyposexualized at the same time because people see us as dragon ladies and also brutes. So Asian bodies are also largely commercialized, often called oriental, exotic, and this can bring many Asians to question where they may physically fit into society, especially Western society. Whether or not they want to break these stereotypes, to add to it, how do these stereotypes like relate to themselves and how can they participate or not participate in them? Okay. <laughs> We're still there. <laughs> um, so to add, Asians are also often seen as a part of sexual fetish culture. And this also plays into queer art, whether or not um, Asians are making queer art about their own bodies or non-Asians are making art about Asian bodies. So this brings into question how do Asians fit into art, specifically queer Asians who make perhaps make work that is breaking away from those stereotypes that are perpetuated or imposed onto them, and how do others uh, interact with them? An artist that deals with this topic a lot is Scott Sushitani, and in his work Geisha is a photo that is manipulated to express the complicated turmoil of how Asians are presented. And using the Geisha photo that was used for a museum poster, Sushitani is representing one way Asians are seen in the world, which is being fetishized as an object, and it's perpetuating that stereotype. And putting himself in the image, he is showing how Asians are constantly being push back into labels and spaces we have tried to get rid of, or at least tried to get rid of the stereotypes that are associated with those titles and groups. Queerness in art can be more direct and outright, like we were discussing before, but it can also be much more nuanced and less forward. So for example, um, something that a lot of South Asian and Southeast Asian artists are participating in is the idea of gift economy. Gift economy was originally a Native American practice where in which they practiced gifting their needs or other people's needs to each other um, rather than purchasing. There was no money, there was no um, buying or selling involved at all. And this oftentimes allowed their community to be stronger because gift giving ultimately creates a bond that perhaps selling and buying does. In the past, that was very much looked down by the colonizers and therefore demolished, which is why we have what we call a free market economy today. However, in the present, many Asian artists, specifically South Asian artists, are using this technique to share their own art. And they're using, oftentimes they're using tools such as the internet, or in which art and work can be shared and gifted for free creating bonds between artists and their community. In relation to many Asian cultures, this practice can be tied to ideas of karma, uh, where in which people will uh, act or give with good intent, and therefore the same good intent will be eventually enacted upon them as well. This also plays into many Asian artists par participating in decolonizing our practice, um, using the internet and gift economy to clear the impacts of colonialism and imperialism, such as market economy. So how do these two things relate to queer art? Right. Queer Asian art. Right. So um, 
Playing something in general um, is normally seen as practicing something that is out of the norm, and thus gift economy, and thus in the gift economy, um, many queer Asian artists are using a system which has been deemed not normal or out of the norm by colonizers and imperialist systems of power, and therefore they are making their own space for themselves and empowering their own practice and um, other people of color as well as their own culture and other people's culture. So an example of this is the artist Hassan Alahi. He is a Bangladeshi living in America and one of his more prominent pieces includes a web-based project called Tracking Transients where he continuously posts very minute details of his everyday life as a South Asian man in America. This presenting an alternative to market economy because he is giving away his own information freely and continuously. Therefore, others who may have ideas or information or thoughts on what it is to be a South Asian man in the U.S. can gain more insight and knowledge on what it actually is. And with that, we're going to go and talk about our own art practices and our theses because querying is just being apart from the binary, but it's also so much more and also how we use our Asian identity in our art or not in our art. Personally, I think much of my art stems from small snippets of my childhood. Growing up, um, much of my life, I didn't coincide with perhaps how others thought I ought to be, for instance, an American but not, an Asian but not, and a girl but not. All of these things, I'm somehow um, a part of the binary and yet somehow not. So a lot of my work has to do with larger ideas of safety, reminiscence, and nostalgia in a more abstract way. Um, I think much of my work isn't directly related to my identity as a queer Asian American, but there are more nuanced aspects that I think affect it. For instance, a large reason why I make art in general is because it is a way for me to feel and work through and express my emotions. Much of my work relates to aspects of love, wondering, and working through it. Growing up in an immigrant Asian American household, I'm sure you can relate where love and emotion is a direct or outward or a large part of the family life, I often turn to art to create and to express these emotions on my own. Therefore, I, it gives me an outlet to contemplate feelings of love, affection, and sympathy. In my art practice, the two factors in my life that are always found in my art are my relationships towards other people and my many identities because relationships are so important in my work it's how I connect with other people and also the way that I connect with the deep roots that I've grown in myself with others my identity is one of the most important parts of my life it's the internal conflict I've struggled with and I will always struggle with and it always drives my passion in my work many times I connect the two with the expression of food because the complicated relationship with my culture it can always be expressed with food imagery or real food that I share with others. By using food, something that ultimately brings people together, I can create art that can relate to others even if they cannot relate on a personal level to my own experience. And my queerness affects my art, but I don't think I explicitly make art about me being queer, and I'm open to exploring it more, but it has not been as prevalent from such an early age, like being Asian obviously had all my life. So I wanted to specifically talk about two pieces of my art that I've done this year. Um, sharing a meal every day is talking about how the most important human connection to me that we can share with others is food because we need it to survive and we use it as a tool to show care for others and we have literally built empires around food. So in one week I spent every day making one meal with a friend and connecting with them through the act of cooking and recording it to show others 
was a way for us to connect on a deeper level. So one of my current projects that I've been working on this semester is uh, a set of Chinese zodiac boxes. Each zodiac has their own box, including the cat, who isn't actually a zodiac, but is part of the folktale. And the inclusion of the cat was really important to me because I kind of put myself in the cat's position. I feel that I'm usually out of place in situations because I'm either around people that don't look like me or I'm around people that look like me but do not understand the implications of being queer and how that affects me. And it's hard to balance those two things and fit in entirely and it's almost as you're fitting in but you're not. So in conclusion, the world is complicated. <laughs> Then it can get more complicated once you have minority identities, such as people of color or queer, being queer, that are not favored in society. Um, and these often create a perception of how you may fit into the world or not, even if it isn't correct or you don't know that they apply. It's important to make space for yourself because as diasporic people, we will always have to create spaces for ourselves, no matter, no matter where we go. And being many identities is something that we should be proud of and celebrate, even if it's really difficult and hard. We hope that you've learned something today about the queer, contemporary, or, and Asian artist experience.